Thank you so much for joining me for this last session. Uh, it's an honor to be here, and I'm really grateful for your time and attention, especially at this point in the week. Uh, my name is Will Benton, and I'm a software engineer at Red Hat. I work on a team that uh, works at the intersection of distributed systems, data science, and software engineering. And today, I'm going to tell you why we've become really excited about containers and container orchestration for intelligent applications. And by intelligent applications, I just mean applications that have a significant analytics component. But first, I want to start with some history. I bet you didn't think I'd go back to the second century. Uh, this is Ptolemy of Alexandria. He proposed a geocentric model of the cosmos. Imagine the entire universe as a set of concentric spheres and calculated the sizes of each and the, the distances to each of the heavenly bodies and the positions of things. Now, w now we know that this is wrong, but the surprising part about Ptolemy Ptolemaic astronomy is that it was actually pretty useful if you were willing to put up with a super complicated model and make an adjustment of a few percent every couple of years so that things didn't get too out of whack. You could, you could use it for agriculture and navigation and so on. Uh, and this is what people used until the 16th century when Copernicus said, well, no, actually the sun is at the center of the universe. And this model had several benefits. It was simpler, it required fewer adjustments, it explained more things, and it was substantially closer to the truth, although it's still not, not perfect, right? Um, so the interesting thing about this is that we like to see human progress or the progress of science as sort of a cumulative thing, right? We're, we're building on everyone's accomplishments before us. We're standing on the shoulders of increasingly large giants. But uh, 20th century philosopher of science, Thomas Kuhn, actually challenged this idea by introducing the concept of a scientific revolution and a paradigm shift. When we go from Ptolemy to Copernicus, we have to throw away a lot of the work we did to make sense of the cosmos and to make sense of what we've done. Like all that work you did to make adjustments to the, the geocentric model is useless once you have a heliocentric model. So really human progress looks a lot more like this. You do some things, you, you make some progress, and you have to throw that paradigm away and come up with a new one. So Kuhn's book on this topic is called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And it's worth reading if you're interested in philosophy of science or the history of ideas. Well, what does this have to do with analytics? Well, for a long time, we've been operating under a cluster-centric model where you have a compute cluster and, you know, analytics is something you run on your compute cluster as a separate workload. Maybe you devote that to generating reports. Maybe occasionally you do some batch model training. But the demands on this are not that great. Now, like the Ptolemaic model, this paradigm works adequately as long as we don't push it too hard. But increasingly, people are pushing it. They want to run applications in this model as well. They want to run interactive queries and notebooks. They want to run stream processing. And people have done a lot of really clever things to extend this model and make it work here. But I think we're seeing a paradigm shift where analytics isn't just a separate workload that we run on a separate analytics cluster. Analytics is really something that underlies a lot of interesting applications, right? If you think about the applications you use the most, the ones that demand your attention, the ones that demand your money, the ones that are on the home screen of your phone, those things probably all have significant analytics components. So we really want to see a model where instead of thinking about what can we run on our compute cluster, we want to think about what do our apps require. We want to go from a cluster-centric model to an app-centric model. Cluster-centric model no longer makes sense if analytics is no longer something we just run on the side. So in the rest of this talk, I'm going to introduce containers, Linux containers, and explain why you might want to care about them for developing and deploying your applications. I'll present some architectures for running intelligent applications in containers, and I'll do a little bit of history on analytic architectures from the past. Uh, we'll talk about some practical things that you have to worry about to make sure that your containers run correctly and are safe and have high performance, and I'll show you where you can go from here. So. To start off, how many people in here have used Linux containers before? Okay, how many of you have a Linux container in production somewhere? Great. So a lot of people have an idea of what a container is, but if you ask people to define containers, you often get sort of a fuzzy, I know, if it, I see, I know it if I see it kind of answer, because we really associate containers with a constellation of capabilities rather than with a sort of technical implementation. So you'll get answers like, oh, a container is really like a lightweight virtual machine. 
or it's a way that I can isolate my applications from one another and they're not going to interfere with one another. And, and some of them just say, well, this is, this is a packaging format. This is, this is like a Docker image, right? This is something I run in Kubernetes. Um, and all of these things have some truth to them, but they're all wrong in subtle ways, right? So to figure out why these things are wrong, let's look at what a container actually is. And we'll start by looking at the humble Linux process. When you have an ordinary process on a Linux system, you have an environment, you have an executable, and you have pointers to some kernel resources. Now, some of these kernel resources are namespaced, like your process table, your root file system, and your network routes. If you're running in a container, that just means that the kernel can change these namespaces to control what you see. So instead of seeing the same process table as everyone else on the same host, you might see a different process table. Maybe it only includes you. Uh, instead of seeing the same root file system as the init process on your host, you might be running in a subdirectory of that root file system. And your network routes, you may have some new routes. You may not have all the routes that other processes have. We may build route services directly to this container. Um, but other processes on the system can see this process that's running in the container. They know that it's there. And sometimes this process itself can tell that it's running on a container on another system. So a container runtime just provides a convenient way to wrap all this stuff up together and package up a base file system image so you can use it. By contrast, and you can also impose some resource limits on, on containers. By, I, I'm sorry, that's in miles per hour. By contrast, uh, a virtual machine hypervisor runs an actual operating system kernel as a process. And if you're running in a virtual machine, you can't tell that you don't have a whole machine to yourself unless there's a serious bug in the hypervisor. Uh, and other processes running on the same host that your virtual machine is running on, they just see that you have a virtual machine hypervisor running. They can't look inside and see what processes you're running in that virtualized operating system. So a container addresses some of the same use cases as VMs, but it's not a lightweight VM, right? It's, it's a completely different thing and it has some different trade-offs. Um, similarly, because not every resource that you can access from a Linux process is namespaced, a container is not a way to totally isolate applications, but it's a way to provide reasonable isolation at very low cost. And a container is not just something you run in Docker or Kubernetes or a system that, that orchestrates containers. Um, you're really running in a container all the time. You just might be running in a trivial one, right? Because you're still running a process with namespaces. You just might have the same namespaces as everyone else. So when we talk about building applications out of containers, usually people talk about combining them together in microservice architectures. And a microservice architecture is basically where you just have some lightweight, modular, and uh, generally stateless processes that have well-defined interfaces and contracts and can work well together. Um, and this is what we would deploy on a container platform like uh, Kubernetes. Now, service-oriented architectures are nothing new. Uh, and microservices are not free of trade-offs, but the trade-offs they have are actually pretty good for the kinds of applications we want to do. And we can see what some of the advantages are for operators and developers. For operators, uh, microservices are really easy to scale up. If you have a large single machine, you can run as many microservices on it as the machine can stand. Uh, if your large single machine is no longer sufficient to run your application, you can scale out by moving these services to different machines. Since they communicate through well-defined interfaces, they don't have to be co-located on the same physical hardware. In fact, if these are stateless components, and any one of them can, you can replace the one to do the job, then you get these other nice benefits like you can run a bunch of copies of one of these services behind a load balancing proxy. Or if one of them crashes and goes away, you can replace it trivially. Uh, microservices have great trade-offs for developers as well. Uh, because stateless services are easier to test and debug than stateful services. I mean, how many times have you like tried to reproduce some sequence of events to reproduce a bug in a, in a complicated system? It's pretty tough. But with microservices, you're almost dealing with, um, it's, this is a bit of a stretch, but you're almost dealing with pure functions, right? You just sort of need to say, I have an API, I have a contract, and does what I get satisfy that contract or not? And if it doesn't, you know you have a bug and you know where to look for the bug.
Another really huge advantage of microservices for developers uh, is that you have a possibility to develop a great workflow. And we saw this in uh, Galdera's talk uh, in the last session, uh, where you can have tooling that checks for a new commit in a Git repository. And when, when it sees a new commit, it fires off continuous integration. If continuous integration succeeds, it builds a new image with your changed code, and it pushes it into production seamlessly without you having to do anything about it. You just you commit. If it works, you, maybe you sign off on it, but you automatically get that upgrade. And since continuous integration and continuous deployment, it's, if you really think about it, it's just a way to orchestrate an experiment, right? So this is not just good for developers. It's also good for data scientists. How many of you have gotten a notebook from a colleague that you couldn't run on your machine and get the same results? Anyone? Notebooks are for reproducible research, but they're not always reproducible. But if you have a container workflow like this, where you have the entire environment that you run it in packaged up in a neat way, um, and then you have continuous integration on it, you can get these better guarantees and really get more reproducible results. So another term that we talk about with containerized applications is this idea of cloud native applications. And the Cloud Native Computing Foundation is an organization uh, that's designed to sort of help people design these kinds of applications and advocate for them. And their definition is that we have applications that are containerized, which we've covered, uh, that are microservice oriented, which we've covered, and that are dynamically orchestrated, which basically just means that they can scale themselves out elastically. Now, the interesting thing about these definitions is that if we think about contemporary analytics frameworks like Apache Spark and Apache Flink, they scale out elastically, right? These things are dynamically orchestrated. And the thing that might be less obvious is that these things are also microservice oriented, but I'll show how that works on the next slide. But I think it's fair to say that if we have two out of three of these, the contemporary analytics frameworks we want to use might not be cloud native, but they're at least cloud naturalized, right? So let's see how microservices fit into something like Spark. If we think about how Spark works, we have a model where we have a distributed collection uh, that's in chunks of memory on various executor processes, and we have a master which distributes tasks to each of these executors, which then calculate the results. So these executors are essentially microservices to calculate the values of partitions. And in fact, with Spark, these things are essentially stateless if we ignore cache, which, which we can do because it's an optimization, right? I'm sorry, it's late in the day. <laughs> but um, but if, we, if, we, uh, if one of these goes away, we have the lineage graph for the RDD or the data frame, and we know how to reconstruct it. So these things are essentially microservices to calculate the values of partitions. OK, so that was a sort of whirlwind introduction to containers, microservices, and cloud native applications. Uh, I want to talk now about architectures for applications, but I'm going to start by contrasting them with architectures people have used in the past. Let's look at the classic transaction processing database and analytic processing database to start with. In this setup, we have events uh, that we're going to transform and we have events that come directly from users. We're going to federate these with some business logic, do some other transformations and put them into a database that's optimized for concurrent writes and, and fast uh, commits. Now, this database is not going to be suitable for analytic processing. It's probably not even going to be suitable for sort of sim simple aggregates. And it's the thing that our business is running on, so we're not going to put analytic processing on it anyway, right? We don't want to put anything on the critical path. So we're periodically going to mirror the data from this database to a different database that's optimized for a different use case, that's optimized for uh, reads, that's optimized for complicated queries. And we'll use that to support analysis, which is you know, often in this kind of architecture, we're talking about reporting, we're talking about taking multidimensional data and putting it on a spreadsheet. Um, but maybe we're also training something and sending that back to our application to use in how it transforms the raw data we see. Um, and finally, we can support interactive queries uh, by analysts as well. So this is a setup that you know we've, we've all seen this in the wild, right? People have, people have done this for a long time. It works pretty well. Databases are great. You have joins. You have uh, a lot of really useful functionality in databases. But what you don't have 
uh, is you don't really have a great way to scale out the transaction processing part, or historically you haven't. I mean, people are people are working on this, right? This is a, this is an interesting active problem. Uh, so you can't get commodity scale out with this. And the analytic processing, you have SQL and you have stored procedures, but if you want to do anything sort of with training a machine learning model, it's, it's a little more painful to do in a database, right? So this is not perfect for the kinds of apps we want to write, and it, it has some limitations. Um, the, the sort of Hadoop-style data lake architecture uh, addresses those limitations uh, by saying, well, we have a lot of commodity hardware, and we can provide scale-out storage on that hardware. And oh yeah, one of the problems with this uh, transaction processing database is we don't have the raw data around. So if we realize we made a mistake with transforming it, we have no way to recover what we did unless we keep a, keep a log somewhere. So with Hadoop, we're just, gonna, we're just gonna archive all the raw data to our distributed file system, and we get scale-out storage, and then we'll write our compute jobs so that these compute jobs migrate to where the data are. So if I'm operating on some, some part of the data, I'll have a job that runs on it and these, these jobs can communicate and shuffle around and write the results back to the distributed file system. So this is a great way to get scale out storage and scale out compute on commodity hardware. And it's, it's, been, uh, it's been a pretty exciting idea for you know, over 10 years now. Um, the problem that both of these architectures have though is that they're both great ways to sort of do analytics as a workload, but they're not necessarily awesome places for applications because there's not really a natural place for all the kinds of applications we want to run. Uh, in the first case, with the, with the databases, you, don't, you have to manage and schedule applications outside of the database, right? And you have to do it in such a way that's sensitive to other demands on your database. Your transaction processing database can't go down or else you can't do any more business, right? Um, and so you need to decide which clients to prioritize, you need to do rate limiting and so on. In the second case, um, you know, you can, you can run applications that are implemented with Hadoop MapReduce or, or on Yarn, uh, but you know, maybe that's not the kind of application you wrote, right? So, so there's another sort of integration challenge there. And you also can't scale out these compute and storage independently because you, know, you, you basically need to have as many machines devoted to this as you have uh, devoted to your storage. So I'm going to argue that architectures that separate analytics from applications, again, only make sense if analytics is a separate workload. We really want to look at an architecture where we're considering the analytic demands of individual applications, and that's how we want to deploy applications. So I want to propose um, a really high-level architecture that you can use that makes sense for doing these analytic applications in containers. At a high level, what is your intelligent application doing? Well, it's getting data from a bunch of different sources. It's getting a stream of events, right? It's getting structured data from databases. It's getting uh, unstructured data, maybe from file or object storage. And I'm gonna try not to raise Steve's ire by talking positively about object storage in this talk. But it's gonna transform data from those sources and it's gonna federate the transformed data and it's probably gonna archive that transform data or maybe archive the raw data somewhere. Then we're going to do something interesting with that data, right? We need to learn from it. We need to use it to make our application better. So we're going to train a model. And that model, you know, maybe that's going to be a service that we run as, as an individual microservice. Maybe it's going to be an object that just stores a bunch of coefficients that we store in an in-memory data grid like in Finispan. And we might also use these models to influence how we transform incoming data, you know, to deal with, uh, to deal with model drift and so on. So we also need to support some user interface components. Um, you know, maybe there's a developer UI so you can add new business rules or explicitly add a model that you've trained outside of the application. There's the actual UI for the application, which is maybe, maybe a website or maybe a mobile app. Um, or the back end for a mobile app, um, a reporting interface for the business side, and a management interface to make sure that the service is running appropriately and has, has decent latency, and so on. So in this diagram, I'm basically using blue for storage, uh, persistent or ephemeral storage. I'm using orange for compute, and I'm using green for user interface components. Now, the storage, the persistent storage, is going to outlive any deployment of our app. So it's going to live outside of containers. 
Um, but this operational storage, this, this model cache we have, can live in a container. The UIs are often just sort of simple views into, into the uh, application state. They're going to be reading from that operational store. They're going to be interacting with components that are interacting with persistent storage. So we can easily run those in stateless containers as well. Now, you might say, and then the, the compute part in orange, as we've discussed, those are already microservices, right? So you can run those in stateless containers as well. Now, you might say, well, great. So I really want to run my application in containers. I already have a Spark cluster. So why don't I just schedule my applications alongside my Spark cluster, right? Well, then you get this issue where you need to sort of manage the, uh, manage the scheduling so that you're, you're, you're dealing with a scheduler for, for Spark jobs. You're dealing with a scheduler for application components. They need to cooperate. So it's really not a good scene. It's not ideal, right? And multi-tenant compute clusters are pretty hard to manage, right? I don't, is it, does anyone argue with that? I, I think that's a non-controversial point, but I, I don't know. Right. No one has willingly argued with me on that in the past, but I'm always curious, right? So, so a better model that we've seen is to take this cluster-centric model and turn it inside out, go to an app-centric model, and actually put the compute clusters in the application. We run everything under container orchestration in, uh, in Kubernetes or uh, in OpenShift, which is an application platform built on Kubernetes. And we just say, well, hey, we can get our multi-tenancy at the container orchestration level. We can run all of these things together. They're cheap to set up and tear down. And we can schedule application components along with the compute resources they depend on. We can scale these out as we need to. And again, these analytic components are just microservices. They work really well in containers. Well, they work really well on containers once you cover a few potential stumbling blocks. And that's what we're going to talk about now. We'll start with correctness, including security. And then we'll talk about performance. And after this part of the talk, I hope you'll, you'll know how to put, put uh, containers into practice in a way that will uh, in a way that'll work really well for you. First, though, I want to talk about security. And I think with any computer security topic, especially with containers, you need to think about the continuum of trade-offs you have, right? And decide what you're comfortable with. And so I want to start by explicitly examining the continuum of trade-offs we have. Let's think about one way to get a whole bunch of job, a whole bunch of computers doing a whole bunch of computation. Individual computers doing their own thing, not connected by a network. It's pretty secure, right? And none of these can interfere with each other, but it's also not very interesting because they, they can't cooperate or communicate. It's not, not very flexible. So how about instead we take a bunch of computers that are connected by a network? Um, if, we, if we do this together, we can run different services on different dedicated machines. Um, you now, your whole system is probably going to be affected if one service starts misbehaving or crashes, but if a service or an operating system on one of these machines crashes, it's probably not going to make the rest of the system crash. And communication between these machines is always going to happen in well-defined ways. It's going to happen via message passing, via an explicitly shared file system, via something that you can understand and control, which is going to limit the potential for problems if something misbehaves and tries to write something that something else has to trust. So going a little finer grained, we could look at the idea of running a bunch of virtual machines on the same physical machine. We have a little, we, have a little, we can uh, pack a bunch of bunch more processes that are isolated on a smaller amount of hardware, but we're paying some non-trivial overhead for all of these hypervisors and all of the operating systems that we're running in them. And uh, if one of these crashes, it's not going to take down the others. But if the host crashes, it's going to take down everything. Right? We can go still finer grained and imagine running multiple containers in multiple containers with services on the same host. Now, containers offer extremely low overhead, like almost imperceptible overhead. And the namespacing and quota mechanisms we have offer pretty good isolation. Uh, typically, your containers aren't going to be sharing a root file system, which eliminates a large class of exploits where one process overwrites a file that another process trusts. Right. 
Our last option uh, for, the most, for the lowest overhead is to just run every service as a regular process in the same namespace on the same host. There's not really any advantage to doing this over running processes and containers, but there's no isolation, so there are disadvantages. Please don't do this. I think that the trade-offs containers offer actually make a lot of sense. You can get nearly no overhead and a reasonable amount of isolation. But there are still some things you can do to improve the isolation that you get. The first thing you do is don't trust that isolation, right? Remember, containers do not provide complete isolation. If you run SE Linux, you can dramatically limit your exposure to bugs in your container runtime or to malicious code running in a container. SE Linux effectively walls off processes and files, meaning that even if something escapes the container or can see outside of its namespaces, it won't have unrestricted access to the rest of your host. And in the last six months or so, people who were running SE Linux in production were totally protected from a zero-day exploit in Docker. So this is actually a real-world concern. The second thing to remember is that for the most part, users are not namespaced. So if you're running as root in a container, you're running as root on your host. A containerized process that's running as root and somehow changes or escapes its namespaces can wreak havoc on your system. In general, you don't want to run things as root in containers for the same reason you don't want to run ordinary processes as root. Why you don't want to pipe, you know, some random shell script from the internet to bash as root. Uh, namespaces for user IDs have been under development and they've been about six months to a year away for quite a while, but I don't think many people are running them in production yet. Uh, they are an experimental option in recent Linux kernels and Docker releases, but it's uh, still, still on the horizon. Another concern, uh, especially if you're doing contemporary analytics, is that you might not have a password file in your container. So a lot of libraries that you want to use, including the Hadoop file system library, will want to look up the currently active user from the user ID in the password file to figure out what their name is. Now, if you don't have a password file, that's going to fail and crash. Fortunately, there's a program called NSS Wrapper that will let you run arbitrary programs with pretend password files so that they can look up the user you're currently running as. Another security issue we might have to worry about is a denial of service. Namespacing provides really good isolation for resources that are namespaced, but not every resource is namespaced. And you could imagine that a process could allocate a lot of resources that are not namespaced and prevent other processes from making progress. A more dramatic form of denial of service stems from the fact that we're all running on the same kernel. And you can crash the host, right? If we crash the host, we've essentially denied service to anything else running on the host. Unfortunately, kernel panics from user space code are still pretty rare, but this is a good reason to test everything and have good continuous integration and make sure that you're pretty confident that the code works before you put it into production. The last security issue we'll look at is an interesting one for containerized applications. If we think about the fact that persistent storage is usually going to live outside of containers and we're usually going to access it via a service interface like HDFS or an object store or a different kind of shared file system, we are going to have credentials to access that. And since our container images are typically immutable uh, and you're going to be using the same image in development, test, and production because you want to benefit from your continuous integration, right? you need some place to keep these credentials. Um, the first thing you can do, which you, which you don't want to do, is actually keep these in source control. It's a bad idea. I don't need to elaborate on that, do I? I didn't think so. Uh, the second thing you can do is you can actually store uh, sensitive information in the in environment and use your container runtime to configure that. Uh, it's possible this would leak out, but this is so much better than, uh, than using source control that it's, it's, it's probably OK. And the third and best thing to do is to use a dedicated secret management service, like the secrets mechanism in Kubernetes, or a standalone service like Vault, something that's designed to hold secrets. Um, is going to give you flexibility and security. And that's really where you want to go um, with uh, managing credentials and secrets. OK, so we've talked about correctness. Now I'd like to talk about performance. And the first thing you might say, which is my first performance pitfall, is, Will, all of this security talk has me really nervous. I bet I could just run a container inside a hypervisor 
And if I ran all my containers inside hypervisors, I'd be okay, right? Well, hypervisors introduce kind of a ton of overhead, right? Like on the order of 10% or so. And if you can use more lightweight isolation mechanisms, you can preserve your performance. So that's the first thing I say is, is just use the lightweight isolation mechanisms that make sense for containers and accept that the trade-offs for security are pretty good. Anecdotally, a lot of people are concerned about the impact that this virtual network routing will have on a data intensive application. A colleague of mine has done a lot of testing with machine learning workloads and she's shown that there's typically around a 5% uh, impact. There's really a minimal impact on overall application performance and in many cases, the impact of running in containers versus not running in containers is lost in the noise. One thing that you do have to worry about though is the performance of your I.O. configuration. If you have a disk mounted on the container and it's a loopback device, you'll have very poor performance for anything that has to hit that disk. So there are best practices for using disks with containers and definitely make sure to check that out and keep that in mind. Another surprising issue with containers and performance is interaction between resource quotas and common optimizations. For example, your default garbage collection configuration may use the JVM's parallel GC where you're tuned for throughput and you're gonna burn a lot of extra cycles in order to get good throughput. Um, a colleague of mine has shown that in containers when you're in a CPU constrained environment, it may be better to trade a little bit of throughput or a little bit of latency for not burning all your CPU quota on the garbage collector. Another interesting uh, issue with containers is um, the idea of some clever optimizations that certain applications use that have surprising impact in containers. Um, if you consider Spark, Spark uses the operating system buffer cache in the shuffle. Basically, when you have a shuffle in Spark, you write to disk, but you don't sync. The assumption is that that data is never gonna hit the disk and that you're just getting some off heap storage for free. And if you run out of actual physical memory, it will, it will hit the disk, but ideally it won't. Now this is a great optimization in the general case. It's, it's clever, it's elegant, it's nice, but that buffer cache usage counts against your memory quota if you're running in a container. So you need to think about that. The last uh, surprising interaction between the JVM and containers I wanna mention is memory. And for a long time, the JVM has not been aware of quotas. So you could happily ask the JVM to give you more memory than your memory quota would allow. And you would only find out that it was a problem when the kernel killed you <laughs> because you exceeded your resource limit. Um, another subtle problem is that the Java runtime's notion of available processor cores didn't take into account CPU resource limits that might be applying to your container. So if you're using a recent build of OpenJDK, I'm delighted to tell you that this isn't a problem anymore. If not, you'll need to worry about setting these limits manually and in conjunction with whatever quotas you're imposing on your containers. And here's what this looks like in a recent OpenJDK. It's past uh, build 131, I think, of OpenJDK 8 and uh, in recent builds of OpenJDK 9. But to get um, C group memory limits for your heap on the Java, you just use this experimental option here. And for CPU, the runtime.getRuntime available processors method will do the right thing in recent OpenJDKs. So I wanna wrap up now by quickly reiterating what we've talked about and show you how to get involved and use these uh, techniques for your own applications. The cluster-centric model made sense when analytics was a separate workload that ran alongside the rest of our businesses, but that's no longer the case. As we've seen, as we're, as we're continuing to see, there's a revolution underway from this cluster-centric model to an app-centric model where we care about apps and analytics really um, underlie every important capability that we want to provide to our customers or to our users. We introduced the ideas of containers, container orchestration, microservices, and cloud-native applications, which are currently hot topics in general application development, but we also discussed some concrete details of how you can take these concepts and apply analytics in those contexts as well. On the architectural front, we saw that fortunately, many of the frameworks we want to use are already cloud-native. They're already a great fit for containers with a little bit of extra work. We've seen that you can embed compute clusters in apps and get multi-tenancy at the resource manager level. And we've talked about how you can use storage outside of containers and access it through service interfaces or APIs.
on the correctness front, we talked about some common sense security things like don't run in as root in a container just because you're in a container and uh, use SE Linux to minimize your exposure to malicious code and bugs and uh, really be careful with your secrets. Okay. Performance takeaways, take advantage of containers. Don't put your containers in hypervisors. Um, don't worry about virtualized networking, measure everything, but virtualized disk is probably gonna be a bigger problem for you than virtualized networking. And again, measure everything. Optimizations that are awesome outside of containers may have a really surprising impact when you use them inside containers, like using the buffer cache as extra op heap storage. So fortunately, we've done a lot of the uh, hard work for you if you're interested in running Spark on OpenShift and Kubernetes. Uh, my team has an open source project called radanalytics.io where you can go to get some tooling to spin up a Spark cluster in containers uh, alongside your application. A containerized Spark distribution, we have some example applications for how you can sort of take advantage of different aspects of this uh, architecture. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I, time and attention are always precious, but they're especially so at the end of a great conference. Um, if you're like me, you're exhausted, but you're ready to get back to work and you have some good ideas. If some of those ideas involve putting your next application in containers, I'd love to hear from you. And if you're interested in doing open source work on a global remote team at the intersection of distributed systems, data science, and software engineering, I'm, I'd really like to hear from you because it's the last slide in my talk, so I have to say that we're hiring. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for the talk. Um, we have time for a couple of questions, if anyone has any. Um, well, I've got one. Um, so you mentioned uh, resource limits. Um, uh, does Kubernetes and things like that provide good ways of like, querying what those limits are for monitoring kind of purposes? Or do you run into that kind of unexpected uh, barrier often in practice? In, in practice, we don't, um, and we, we did things, before, before we had the open JDK support, we sort of did things the, the simple way, right, of saying like, well, we're gonna set these resource limits in conjunction, on, on our JDK in conjunction with the resource limits we have on the container. But yeah, you can interrogate this stuff and, and you, you, you know when you set it up too, so. Um, so we've got a big, uh, I think a good picture of um, how you imagine it for the compute part. And you said then storage comes from somewhere, like electricity comes from the wall. Um, <laughs> so what would you uh, uh, suggest if we want to complete this um, architecture and we also need a st storage layer? Would you then say still run in HDFS cluster next to it? Or what would be your suggestions? I, I think the right answer to that is it depends, right? And I know you already have HDFS, right? So I would say you can run HDFS as a peer to container orchestration, and I think that works pretty well. Um, you don't have, you don't have the uh, locality, but there's a lot of interesting sort of debate about whether or not you are really benefiting from locality as much as you thought you were. That is an amazing argument. Uh, do you have material for that, or maybe you can? L let me give you some. Let, let me give you something offline. Yeah, I, I have a reference. <laughs> So you said um, uh, for the frameworks that are running on a cluster today, you can basically package them into containers and spin them up on containers. I'm curious if I want to do dynamic scaling, where really the framework itself makes the decision that it wants to acquire more resources. How would that play with that approach? That's a great question. So what we have actually on our project is we have a service that sort of pays attention to Spark metrics and communicates with Kubernetes and says, hey, give me another container, because if, if you have Spark's dynamic resource allocation enabled, we say, give me another container and spin it up. The technical detail is that we're running a standalone Spark cluster inside Kubernetes, so it looks to the standalone Spark cluster as if a new machine just showed up and checked in with your master. Right. Okay, I think we're just about out of time. Um, thanks again to Will. Um, 
The final event of the day is uh, just about to start in Kessel House, so you're all welcome to go over there and uh, for the closing session. And um, let's thank the speaker one last time. Thank you.